Coming up next, a song that was written about three different kids intertwined by an unfortunate common thread of isolation and suffering. The song was inspired by true life events, which made the song more personal and more intriguing. The lead vocals were also weirdly authentic, uh, delivered in an unconventional style that made listeners bristle with astonishment and wonder. It's definitely one of the strangest choruses in history. Join us for an exploration into one of the most mysterious songs of the rock era. Stories coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you cared more about the toy in your Happy Meal than the actual food, you're gonna dig this channel of deep musical nostalgia. Make sure to subscribe below right now. Click the red button so you always know when our stuff comes out. Also, check us out on Patreon for even more content that helps us keep it a daily channel. So it's time for another edition of our series, Bottle of Lightning. This is where we break down a song that was king for a day, or for many days. A song that was so big that the artist or band wasn't able to match its success long term. Most call them one-hit wonders. We call them lightning in a bottle here. So I remember, um, it was a few years ago, I was humming, mm -hmm, and my kids, who were really little at the time, said, Daddy, what are you eating that's so good? I want some. I was actually humming the title to The Enigmatic Wonder by Crash Test Dummies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, for short, that's how we'll talk about it here revolves around the peculiar and thought-provoking lyrics that delve into the experiences of various individuals facing unusual circumstances. The song tells separate vignettes, each depicting a different scenario involving children dealing with personal struggles or societal anguish. These include a boy who is bullied for his appearance, a girl who survives a car accident but becomes socially isolated due to her injuries, and a boy whose parents are deeply religious and forbid him you know, from watching TV, amongst other things. Let's put it under the microscope so you get what I'm talking about. In the frosty Canadian city of Winnipeg, amidst the endless winters and boundless prairies, a group of musicians came together under an unlikely moniker, Crash Test Dummies. Lead singer Brad Roberts, initially pursuing a path in academia as a student of English literature, he found himself drawn to the allure of music, live music especially. You wouldn't have predicted that music would have become a serious career choice for Brad at first, since the name of his band before Crash Test Dummies was Bad Brad Roberts and the St. James Rhythm Pigs. That must have been a nightmare to put on a marquee in Winnipeg. Uh, the, specifically Winnipeg's Blue Note Cafe. While CTD started as a cover group, Brad armed with a guitar and a passion for songwriting, he remained hesitant to take up the mantle of lead vocals. He was another artist that you know, we've discovered had serious doubts about the quality of his voice. And Brad was convinced his voice lacked the charm to be a lead singer. Just so happened that his unique baritone was the main reason why the Crash Death Dummies were discovered and signed to a label deal. I mean, you don't forget that voice. As the band started crafting their original material, Brad found himself compelled to step into the spotlight. Despite his reservations, he realized that his distinct delivery was crucial to breathe life into their song compositions. Now, encouragement from a vocal coach served as a turning point for Brad. It convinced him that his deep baritone possessed a special caliber that really set him apart from everybody else. It was a voice unlike any other, resonating with a depth and richness that really would become the hallmark of the Crash Test Dummy sound, and the sound of 1994, really. So with a newfound confidence in his vocal abilities, Roberts embarked on a journey that would forever alter the trajectory of this band. You know, as they ventured into the studio to record their music, Robert's deep guttural humming infused each track with a raw, visceral energy, perfectly suited to his distinctive voice, really. And nowhere was this more evident than on the enigmatic and haunting melody of their breakout hit, mm -mm -mm -mm. Mm -hmm. 
So it was in those early days of this band that Brad's mind stirred with a rhythm, a whisper of music dancing amidst the silence. Without hesitation, he committed the fleeting melody to paper, meticulously crafting lyrics that adhered to a rigid structure. Each verse comprised four syllables per line, uh, with the chorus flowing with a gentle cadence of six syllables. Attention to detail was critically important. Every second syllable bore the weight of stress, infusing each word with a deliberate rhythm. It was a meticulous process for sure, ensuring that the lyrical narration unfolded with precision and purpose. The creative process was the genesis of his signature song. Got into an accident and got and come to school, but... Mmm is a brilliant rock trilogy. It's composed of three verses that are intersected from various experiences that had a profound impact on Brad when he was a child. So let's get into chapter one. Once there was this kid who... The kid that Brad sings about in the first verse of the song was crafted from a blend of real life events. You see, Brad experienced two serious car accidents during his youth. Uh, this left him with a lingering fascination for car crashes. However, as time passed, the trauma started to fade, allowing Brad to detach himself from the painful memories. By the time he penned, mm, uh, he had shifted his perspective, transforming his own experiences into a narrative told from a third-person viewpoint. He said that it was from when the cousin smashed. This enabled him to adopt the role of a storyteller rather than reliving this past in an autobiographical manner. So Another true event that inspired the first verse came from a gripping news story about a man involved in a near-fatal boating accident in Niagara Falls. Uh, so this man's vessel veered dangerously close to the edge of the falls, uh, sparking a moment of sheer panic as he realized uh, the impending danger that awaited him. Amazingly, the boat managed to steer away from the brink just in time, but not before the man's hair had turned stark white from the frightening near-death experience. It's actually a phenomenon called canidus sabitis, which is Latin for sudden graying of hair, where a person's hair can change from a dark to a light color as a result of uh, enduring uh, severe distress. That boat ordeal reminded Brad of similar incidents he had heard about, including one that happened to his great uncle during World War II. As his great uncle huddled on a Japanese occupied island, he listened fearfully to the enemy's uh, menacing threats to kill him and his fellow soldiers in broken English. And this caused a portion of his hair to prematurely turn white. Hair had turned from black into bright white. While these stories didn't directly inspire the song, they definitely contributed to Brad's portrayal of a young boy with a distinctive feature. In Brad's childhood experience, being different often led to being targeted for mistreatment, and for bullying, for ridicule. Thus, the boy with the sudden white hair symbolizes the, the vulnerability of standing out in a world where conformity is often prized, unfortunately. The second chapter of them uh, was also partially inspired by Brad's childhood. He has a birthmark at the base of his spine, which made him a, a regular target for hazing in school. Once again, Brad put himself in the role of a storyteller, and he sings about someone else's embarrassment, this time a girl who is self-conscious about her body, a predicament uh, you know, that he could totally relate to. Once there was this girl who wouldn't go in and change with the girls in the change room, but then they finally made her, they saw birthmarks all over her body. She couldn't quite explain it. They'd always just been there. Been there, right? Always just been there. Now, as we get into the third verse, I want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear. You know, when you choose Zenny and click on our info button up here, they're always running great deals on their site on frames, you choose your color, your shape, your size. Do it today for up to 80% off regular retail prices. Okay, so verse three. The third verse portrays a boy undergoing a phenomenal religious ritual. Although the inspiration stemmed from a girl in reality, Brad opted to depict the character as a boy in his lyrics. 
So he remembered an encounter with a girl whose parents were devout Pentecostal Christians. So every Sunday, they took her to church where members engage in the practice of speaking in tongues. What she explained to Brad was that during these gatherings, some individuals felt compelled to speak spontaneously, believing it to be the language of the divine spirit. They asserted that these utterances were not their own words, but rather a direct transmission from the Holy Ghost. The language was often hard to make out, and she noticed some who seemed to be in a possessed state. They would make bizarre facial expressions with their eyes rolling back in their heads while shaking and lurching, doing this across the floor, adding to an eerie, flat-out, scary atmosphere for this little girl. They went to their church. They Witnessing this ritual, it was unsettling. Um, and as her parents, whom she relied on for guidance, appeared to undergo a sudden transformation. As a child, she told Brad that she found the experience terrifying. Witnessing those shocking live rituals left a significant mark on Brad's friend, shaping her perception of religion and spirituality. Again, this is her experience. Brad captures the intensity of this experience in mm, highlighting the profound impact this experience had on his friend. And lurched all over the church floor. So sometimes during Crash Test Dummies concerts, uh, Brad shows off his lighter side by altering the lyrics just a little bit, changing the third verse uh, from a boy scarred by the theater of Glass Who Salila in a Pentecostal church to a boy whose mother disposed of his tonsils after a tonsillectomy, thus preventing him from taking his removed tonsils to school for show and tell. If that was the subject matter of the original third verse, so it would have changed the entire song. Come directly home right after school in the wind. So car accidents seemed to follow Brad Roberts throughout his life, lingering beyond his youth, and even beyond the strange fascination that inspired the first verse of him. I mean, he even named the band he formed after a car crash. As we know, crash test dummies are used to gauge the injuries a human being would likely sustain during a traffic collision. Then in the year 2000, Brad got into another car crash. In that one, he was extremely lucky to even survive. Miraculously, Brad was able to escape the wreckage just seconds before the vehicle he was driving exploded. Let's begin. Back in 93, Crash Test Dummies, the quintet featured Benjamin Darville on harmonica and mandolin, Ellen Reed on piano, accordion and backing vocals, Michael Dorge on drums, and of course, Brad Roberts filled the roles of frontman, lead guitarist, and lead singer. Brad's brother Dan handled bass and teamed up with Ellen to support his brother's vocals. Mm -mm -mm -mm, uh, was Crash Test Dummies' only hit in America. But prior to that release, the group was very popular in Canada you know, where they were from. The band's debut album titled The Ghost That Haunt Me that came out in 91 sold over 400,000 copies just in Canada. And it yielded a number four hit on the Canadian pop chart with the single Superman song. The world will never see another man. Mmm was the lead single from CTD's second album, God Shuffled His Feet. It was a surprise smash around the globe though. It went to number one in Australia, Iceland, Germany, Denmark, Belgium, Norway, Lithuania, and Sweden. It peaked at number two in the UK, and it went to number four here in the Billboard Hot 100. Number one pretty much everywhere. Now, surprisingly, mm, was not nearly as big on the band's home turf. It stalled at number 14, and God Shuffled His Feet, the album, sold about 100,000 less than their debut there. That's kind of a tough one to explain. It was her only top 40 hit in America, like I said. Superman's song stalled at number 56 here. But the album sold over 2 million copies in America alone. Uh, this song was so big that, of course, Weird Al had to take his bite out of it. And it was brilliant, I must say. Headline News was the lead-off single for the compilation box set Permanent Record, Al in the Box. The song was written after the label convinced him to create a new song to promote the album. I'll combine the music of the Crash Test Dummy songs with uh, three news stories that were popular in late 93 and early 94. And uh, of course, the same year it was used in Dumb and Dumber, the blockbuster. I guess I forgot that you never ever make a mistake. 
The fervor created by mm led to high acclaim for Crash Test Dummies in 94. The song was nominated for the Grammy Award for Best Pop Performance by a Duo or a Group with a Vocal. And even though they've been a unit for more than six years at this point, they were also nominated for Best New Artist at the 94 Grammys. Now, the award in that category went to an emerging artist from the small town of Kennett, Missouri, Cheryl Crow, just put in the Hall of Fame last year. Think back on the first time you heard mm, 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 my crash test dummies. I mean, 10 seconds into the song, you heard Brad Roberts sing, Once there was this kid who, right? With that unorthodox baritone delivery. I mean, it was alarming at first, right? I remember the first time I heard it, I thought it was a joke. I thought the DJ was goofing on me. But as the song moves along, Brad's voice becomes strangely mesmerizing and comforting even. During Brad's narrative of the story of three troubled kids, you feel like you're right there in the middle of the drama. It's very haunting. I, for one, wanted to reach out and pull those kids close to me and put them into a protective force field that shield them from further anguish. It's just a song that gives you a strange but satisfying feeling. The track evoked a feeling that I hadn't really experienced when listening to a song. Uh, not quite like that. Certainly one of a kind. That's what makes mm, such a, a memorable song. If it would have been sung in a more conventional style, it wouldn't have been nearly as powerful. I also love the awe effect in the song's coda, with all three vocalists singing in angelic harmony as if they're you know, opening the gates of heaven. The coda is like a liberation, an escape from the derision of adolescence and the cruel judgment of others. Each of the three kids that Brad Roberts sings about in mm -mm -mm, it's like they're now free to put the past behind them, not allowing the awkwardness of their youth to crush their hopes of finding uh, fulfillment and happiness and joy. There is no assignment of blame or explanation. It's just the way things were. Ultimately, the joy of freedom, it's theirs for the taking. Mm -hmm. Leave us a comment about Crash Test Dummies and the strangely, satisfyingly creepy one hit wonder. Such a cool voice. What are your memories of the song? What do you think? What did you think the first time you heard it? Um, let's have a great discussion about a song that truly was one of the most uh, disturbingly, I mean, not disturbingly, but uh, disturbingly comforting <laughs> songs of 1994. Definitely one of the biggest impacts of that year. If you like our content, we invite you to subscribe below. We'd love to have you as part of our community. Until next time, free chords. <laughs>